Uh, today, our attendees are from different education line, along with a number of students with us as well. We are joined as well by Mr. Danish, the Dean of Health Matriculation Centre. Welcome, everyone. Now, remember, if there is anything that you're unsure of or you'd like to ask our speakers any questions, remember to type in your questions so we can answer them during the Q's and A's. Before I introduce the moderator, there are a couple of announcements I would like to make. Firstly, for those who are not presenting, please mute your mics and do not display your webcam video throughout the session. This is to minimize distraction during the forum. Second, for anyone who would like to ask a question answered by the speakers, please post your questions on the chat box so our moderator can read them out during the Q's and A's. Or you can raise your hands. The option is next to the chat icon. Um, at the end of the session, we'll be organizing a career and course counseling session. So for any attendees who are interested to know more about our programs, do remain in this meeting room at the end of the session and the marketing counsellors will attend to you. Now that we are over with the rules, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for today. The topic for today is TEACH, which stands for Tell, Exemplify, Apply, Coach and Help. Our moderator for today is Ms. Irma, Senior Lecturer of Health Matriculation Centre, along with three panel speakers today. I'll hand it over to Ms. Irma now to introduce her speakers. Irma, over to you. Thank you, Yin Yin. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar under the Art of Teaching and Science of Learning series. My name is Irma Mokhtazar, and I'm a senior lecturer here at Help at Health Matriculation Centre, Help University. Health Matriculation Centre is also popularly known as HMC. For those of you not familiar with us, HMC offers the foundation program. We offer both foundation in arts as well as foundation in science. Today, ladies and gentlemen, HMC is very excited to present TEACH as mentioned by Union. TEACH is actually an acronym for TELL, Exemplify, Apply, Coach and Help, a set of teaching uh, principles that we strongly believe in. In today's session, we would like to share with you a little bit on how the teaching is conducted at HMC and hopefully share with you our aspirations in guiding and preparing our students for their tertiary education and later on their working life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, just a little housekeeping before we proceed. Yeah, kindly mute your microphone during the session as mentioned by Yin Yin. However, should you have any questions, again, please feel to type them in the chat box. We will save them for the Q&A session right at the end. Now, uh, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our panelists. We are lucky to have with us today three wonderful speakers. Let me introduce our first speaker, who happens to be a dear colleague of mine, Dr. Dalwin Dekor. Dr. Dalwin has been teaching English at HMC since 2014. Dr. Darwin obtained her PhD in Curriculum and Instructional Technology from the University of Malaya. She has delivered several plenary and invited talks both locally and internationally. Her research is situated in the field of TESOL, flipped instruction and professional development for teachers. Hello, Dr. Darwin. Hi. Hi. Uh, now on to our second speaker, Sam Khan. Sam, who is our former student, is the COO of Beyond Infinity Consultancy, or BIC for short. BIC aims to bring businesses on board from offline to online. Now this includes doing digital transformation coaching, e-commerce consultancy and advisory, as well as conducting trainings and workshops for businesses. Sam is also a trainer certified by Alibaba Business School and Taobao University. In 2019, Sam was the keynote speaker for Lazada We Commerce. And finally, oh, hi, Sam, are you there? Hi. Oh, hello, lovely to hear from you. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming our third speaker, 
and a former student as well, Raj Mahal, who is a digital strategist with Blank Slate, a digital marketing and creative consulting agency. Raj has been in the industry for over six years now and has assisted numerous SMEs and MNCs such as McDonald's, GrabFood and Pigeon, just to name a few, in crafting stellar digital experiences and improving their social media presence. His areas of expertise lie in the influencer marketing campaigns, social media branding and agency framework building. Welcome, Raj. Hi, Ms. Irma. Thank you for making me sound good. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's all you. It's all you. Well, nice to see you, Raj. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let us now get the show on the road. Since I mentioned our teaching principles earlier, you might be wondering how exactly is the teaching conducted at HMC? So to enlighten us, let me invite Dr. Darwin to shed some light on this. Dr. Darwin. Thank you, Irma. And good afternoon, everyone. All right, well, if you have ever watched a, a basketball match that's played with each other for a long time, you would notice that a good basketball player would know where other players are going to be, what style to pass them the ball, exactly when and exactly where to pass them the ball to set them to score. And if you think of that, that's what we want our students to do. In any learning institution, we want to set our students up to score. So what does this involve? There's communication, there's relationship. Now, I could pass this ball, but if there's nobody on the other end, then what benefit is it? The passer has to be ready for it, and so must the receiver uh, be ready for this. Now, I need to know where my students are, and I need to know what kind of pass, what kind of techniques, what kind of uh, content are they ready for, and when will they be ready for it? And I want to pass ahead. I, don't, I do not want to pass behind them. I want to pass to where they're going and towards higher and deeper learning. So that's that. And there's also good passing techniques. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is that there is a plethora of ways on how content can be passed or delivered to students. Different lecturers in our faculty may have different styles, approaches, or techniques. Some may use the Socratic method, some may flip the instruction, use gamification, case studies, design thinking, etc. However, in spite of the different instructional approaches we use, our shared aim in the faculty is to teach, T-E-A-C-H, to tell, to exemplify, to help students to apply, to coach, and to help. However, it is my personal belief that the most advanced online tool or methodology or instructional design will not help learners to attain an all-encompassing varsity education. Thus, the end goal of our instruction in Health Metropolitan Center is to produce students who are not only capable of scoring, but students who are creative, students who are uh, able to collaborate, students who are able to communicate effectively, and who are critical thinkers. So these four Cs are unquestionably the essential skills that prepare students for the future. Now, we are not only preparing our foundation students for their bachelor programs, but at the same time, we are preparing preparing them for the uh, unique demands of our 21st century world. Now, our faculty is determined to help students to reach their full potential through a holistic education. Therefore, uh, in our program, we offer value-added subjects such as critical thinking skills, which is offered in semester two. We have personal development and leadership, study skills, which are offered in semester one, and cultural art and politics, uh, politics, which is offered in semester three. Now, these subjects are there to help students to inculcate a broader appeal in thinking. Now, students in our programs also attend leadership training, uh, which is conducted over three days that is specially designed to help them to deal with fear, to deal with changes, to cultivate the right values, to promote teamwork, and to instill self-confidence. Now, they also learn human-centric skills through community service programs, which is a compulsory component in study skills, where they learn how to be compassionate, kind-hearted, uh, and kind towards the less fortunate. 
Now, in defining the new models of education for the fourth industrial revolution, if you read the World Economic Forum report, it states that we are now preparing our school children to work in jobs that do not yet exist. Most of them which are likely to have an increased premium on both digi digital and social emotional skills. Hence, our teaching, how do we teach? Our teaching, our programs not only focus on imparting knowledge to students, but we also aim to nurture resilient and socially aware individuals that are ready for the global job market. Yes, thank you, Dr. Darwin, for that very uh, enthusiastic explanation about how we do our teaching over at HMC. And yes, I cannot agree more on the importance of holistic education nowadays. Uh, Dr. Darwin, also thank you for that lovely basketball analogy. I thought that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now that we've learned a little bit on how the teaching is conducted, perhaps it's a good idea to hear from our former students on what they think of our program. So these are the people who've gone through the system per se. So for this, I'd like to invite Sam to share his thoughts with us. Sam, please tell us something about our program. Um, okay, I, I, I remember taking up a HELP uh, Foundation program. Uh, for two reasons. Um, number one, it has a very it has a shorter time frame, so I didn't want to waste my time, and I neither do I have much resources to waste as well. So you know, going further beyond one year, that would be a stretch on the budget. So that was days then. So as compared to many of those programs that's offered outside out of the one year program, and I realized that you know it has sufficient enough of subjects for me to select from. So I can explore between, you know, arts and science, and then I can decide hmm, what do I want to take for, you know, for my degree. Either do I want to take like law or psychology. So it kind of covers the broad spectrum of the area. So within one year, I was able to make my choice. Secondly, I would like to highlight also the, the fun thing about HMC. And until today, it's still very memorable to me. It's what was mentioned by Dr. Darwinda, the leadership program. And until today, it still sticks. And I'm sure Raj will have some stories to share later on, most likely, right? Um, you know, this was one of, the, one of the most striking modules because in, in education, I believe that it is important to have that sort of uh, engaging. And these three days, you know, bringing students out from the comfort zone to somewhere else, a training program that was purely customized to bring out their self-confidence, I thought this was something very good. My exposure in the leadership program is different from my other batch mates. And every time when we meet or when we sit down with other HMC, we will come back and talk about this same topic. Hey, how was your leadership camp at that point of time? You did this, right? Oh my God, this what was, was what happened and we went through. So I thought, you know, um, cultivating leadership among learners, I think that's a very important module for anyone to choose uh, whether you want to study because moving forward, when you come out to the working world, um, we are actually needing uh, more leaders today. And above all, you know, uh, despite all the different experiences of different people put into the leadership program together, uh, you can imagine the amount of learning of that three days and practicing what you learn uh, is so much more important. So I think the leadership program was one of the flagship standout programs uh, for HMC. That's my opinion. That's great, Sam. That's really wonderful to hear. And it's always nice to, to have former students come back and tell us that they've had a fantastic time with us. So I'm really happy that you had a great time during your uh, Of course, we won't, we won't tell people uh, what's going to happen in the three days. We won't, right? So, yeah, let's <laughs> just keep it away. <laughs> yes, what happens at the, the, the campsite stays at the campsite, right? Agree, agree. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, what about you, Raj? What would you have? A, perhaps I can invite you to share some of your thoughts about our program. Um, all right. Let me think where to start because there's a lot of things that I would like to share, right? I think oh, cool. let's start with where Sam talked about the personal development and leadership unit that we took and HMC <laughs> leads as well, which is a student council. I was part of the student council. And let me tell you guys, for everyone who's on the live stream right now, that unit that we took PDL and also being part of the student council has given me all the skills I needed to be one step forward compared to other graduates who have finished university. And I'll tell you why. Because in the foundation in arts program that I was part of, 
it is designed in such a way that you do not only get theoretical knowledge, but you get hands-on yes, practical hands knowledge as well. And let me tell you guys, things like project management skills, uh, knowing how to plan a campaign or plan an event, uh, knowing how to negotiate with people, public speaking, communication skills, all of this is interweaved into the units and the things that you do within this foundation program. And trust me, guys, these are the skills that you need in order to be one step ahead of your peers when you graduate. It's very, very important. It is non-negotiable. In fact, if you look through some studies and research, they will say that 70% of your career success is up to your communication skills. Only 30% is attributed to your skill or your technical knowledge. So both are equally important but we cannot discredit the merit that communication has in that. And the FIA or the FIS program, Foundation in Arts or Science, the program incorporates these elements of communication and negotiation, um, which is, I think, really absolutely amazing. The second thing that really stood out to me, um, observing the job market now, in the past, there is a very high demand for specialists. Specialists meaning people who are extremely well-versed in one specific industry or in one specific skill. And the trend that we have been noticing along the years is that, yes, being specific is important. You need to have that one thing which you're really good at, but there are a basket of <laughs> other skills that should come along. So instead of being very specific, you have to be sort of a generalist in certain sense as well. You need to have business acumen. You need to know uh, the basics of business. Like I said, communication is important. Knowing economics, uh, knowing programming if you're into digital or knowing creativity, you need to have these skills as well. And what really caught my attention with the Foundation in Arts program was we do have core units, units which everybody has to take, but you are given the option of electives as well. And these electives are not something that, you know, okay, I'll just randomly pick some subject and just throw it into my course to make it sound good. They are all really well selected and well thought out. When I was in Foundation five, six years ago, I actually took a programming course, Visual Basics Programming. And even though that programming language might not be the most popular or the most used programming language now, when you learn programming, you learn logic. You learn how to build things step by step. And I believe, to quickly round off my point, because I might be going on a, on a, on a long conversation <laughs> now, uh, to quickly round off my point is that the fact that we are given electives which are well thought of, it really helps you develop a bit more of a generalist skill set which will really, really, really benefit you once you enter into the working force. So that is why I think the Help Foundation program really stands out um, in, in the market right now. Okay, just a disclaimer, we're not paying you for this, right, Raj? <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm absolutely delighted to hear of your wonderful experience with us. And I'm so happy to hear that you, you still remember what happened five or six years ago. So that's lovely. And the fact that you actually mentioned PDL and the fact that we have some really, really carefully selected electives and that we do, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, as you're all well aware, our former students here today, our panelists here, hold very, very successful careers. So I'm curious to know if our teaching principles that we hold so dear have had a part in helping them in their career. What would be your comments on this, Raj? Have we helped you in any way? So to summarize my answer, yes, absolutely, most definitely. <laughs> uh, my experience in HMC has helped me. I'm not too sure about the teaching principles exactly because I think compared mm -hmm. to Dr. Dalwinder, for example, I might not be very well versed with the with the frameworks or the theoretical knowledge behind it, right? Uh, but definitely, like I mentioned before, the practical experience that we get, the practical knowledge that I got from being in the Foundation in Arts program really, really uh, skyrocketed my career. That's for sure. So I'll give you an example. I'll share with you guys a story, right, for everybody mm -hmm. who's in the live stream right now. Um, so I was part of... Uh, HMC Leads, that's our student council. At that point of time, it was being run by Dr. Fikri, who I think is in the live stream right now. And we were supposed to organize an event. So keep in mind, we are fresh out of secondary school. Uh, you know, back in secondary school, it's just, okay, SPM, that's the biggest hurdle and, and like an end of story, right? And then yeah. we make this big transition into college. 
and it's a it's a culture shock for most of us we're getting used to this new lifestyle to be given more responsibility and suddenly now you know we're given this this task of organizing an event called HMC Rush which is uh, an amazing race kind of event which spanned around the whole of Kuala Lumpur a fresh uh, secondary school graduate student 18 years old our lecturers come up with this idea and they say okay we're going to support you where you can but you guys take charge and organize something like this so for an 18 year old kid to be given the responsibility and the trust to organize these kind of events uh definitely you learn so many things you learn things that people take years to learn once you enter into the working force and in fact right after graduating uh from foundation in arts i actually started a, a career in event consulting and event management and event hosting as well just from this experience that i got in organizing hmc rush and a few other events during my time there in the foundation in arts program um so definitely if your teaching principle is to you know give us practical experience and practical knowledge if it's not spoon feeding guiding mm -hmm. but at the mm -hmm. end of the day you have to do the hard work and you have to learn through mistakes i think yes definitely that has been a principle that i've held very very dearly up until now and for 30 40 50 years into the future as long as i'm going to be working oh that's so good to know raj okay uh sam What's your take on this? Have we helped you in any way? Um the short answer is yes. Uh but maybe <laughs> I can share with you a little bit on uh okay. teaching principles. So just like Raj, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not very familiar with you know the books and teaching principles and the theories. Uh but two things that have happened in HMC. Number one, um the lecturers. Um I still remember that the lecturers that have taught me today are still in HMC like Miss Selina, Mrs. Siva. These are the to name a few. and even the the admin staff that have been you know um i've been in hmc more than 10 years ago <laughs> right so hi raj <laughs> <laughs> right and and i remember you know it is these people who actually uh, made an impact in our lives um because the way that they teach is they use their heart and they don't they don't they don't calculate based on okay today i'm just going to lecture you based on this module and that's about it it doesn't what they did my lecturers did to me was that they cultivated curiosity and i still remember my first class was an english class i was learning english and and miss selina was the first one who who actually prod us to have a debate and she would poke into you and ask what do you think about this why do you think like that what backs up you thinking this manner well in school we were never we were never taught in this manner because in school we were just following textbooks right so immediately when you transition to college wah you suddenly you have to think you know and even thinking you cannot just think in a rojak manner you have to literally mm -hmm. have facts and statements to back up because anything that comes out from your mouth has to have some factual facts and it's not just assumption so that was one thing that uh, you know from an english class not just teaching me to be good in my english um and also my grammar as well because i had a lot of grammars to fix um but she also taught me in terms of that thought processes right before mm -hmm. something comes out of your mouth think through first why do you say like that how should you say it and what backs up your fact so that's number one i think the teachers are amazing the lecturers are amazing it's always the people that is part of the teaching principles to me the second one similar to raj um year end and i remember i was the second batch of hmc whereby we had to come up with a HMC ball organize an event for more than 100 and 130 packs as i remember um i mm -hmm. i wasn't part of student council but i've always hang out in student council and eventually i somehow became part of them and helped them to organize as well i still remember during those uh, stumble blocks when we start off um we didn't know what exactly we needed like sourcing for venue and then there's something so called for asking for sponsorship i was like thinking what do you mean by asking for sponsorship It means someone can come and we have to pay less i never knew that term until when i went to college and we also had a wonderful lecturers as well who would be like the chairing committee uh, they will come in share their experiences and then we would tell them what are the ideas that we had and being young 18 year olds um, we have big ideas huge ideas but then our lecturers will always tell us big ideas are good how do you operationalize it similarly in the working world everyone uh, have a big idea like an innovative idea the question is how do you operationalize it everyone can speak big idea how do you do it so step 1 this is your idea step 
filter it. What is doable, what is not doable. And then step three, mm -hmm. who are the people that you can reach out so that you don't have to do everything on yourself. And one thing I learned is leverage on network. So these are the three things that I primarily learned in, 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 in HMC. And I hope this is part of the teaching principle that have imparted the people, mm -hmm. the methodological process and network. So these are the three things that I really steer clear when I was in HMC. Oh, that, that's lovely to know. And thank you for the lovely shout outs to your, to your ex lectures. I'm sure they'll be very happy to know that you still remember them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think today's session will be complete without touching on the current situation and how it has affected the way we conduct our teaching. The MCO has forced us to make some really drastic changes to the way we teach. I still remember the last time I taught my students in the classroom. Uh, March 17 seems like a very long time ago. So it has actually been a very long time since I've been able to walk into a classroom, turn on the projector, use the whiteboard, have interesting conversations and lively banters with my students. I don't know if they miss me, and I can't believe I'm saying this live, but I, I actually miss them. Uh, simply because now all I have of them are their initials on my screen, because that's what we've been doing, ladies and gentlemen, we've been doing online teaching. Now, as with all the other higher education institutions, Help University has also transitioned to online teaching. Perhaps Dr. Dalwin can share with us how HMC has been coping with and adapting to this, Dr. Dalwin. Yes, thank you, Irma. Now, I would say it's very heartwarming to hear uh, about what Raj and Sam has mentioned about HMC. Now, despite having left HMC many years ago, they still remember the signature programs. They still remember how their lecturers, has, uh, their lecturers have made an impact on their lives. And it's really very lovely to hear their wonderful stories that they have, re uh, they have just shared. Yeah. Now, when... Talking about the transition from conventional teaching to online teaching, now I would agree with Irma, I definitely miss face-to-face. -face. I definitely miss going to my classroom, walking into my classroom, seeing my happy faces. Now I would definitely see the initials, just like Irma said. Now the immense impact of our COVID-19 outbreak in Malaysia has made it necessary for us to transition to online teaching and learning. But in my point of view, I wouldn't, use the term online teaching to describe this phenomenon or this situation. For me, content delivery that's offered online in response to a crisis differs greatly from a well-planned online instructions. Now, all our face-to-face -face instructions were well-planned, online courses are well-planned, but this is a temporary, sudden, and forced shift of content delivery. And we hardly had about one or two days to prepare to move to our emergency response teaching. That's so right. to me, ERT would be a better term to describe whatever we are doing now. This is an emergency response teaching, which has become a solution, a, a temporary solution under current crisis circumstances. And no doubt this abrupt migration has uh, affected our instruction in many ways. Now, first of all, we are, all our approaches are now solitary and didactic not only for lecturers, but even for students. Now, we lecturers do not get to meet and chat, chat about our classes or work in staff room. Neither do students get to meet or hang around in their student lounges or hallways. So we are all alone in our own home setting, just like how students are passively sitting and watching either pre-recorded videos or live lectures. We lecturers are also on our own. But it's very good to know that now we are in our three, uh, uh, third month, right, Irma? This is our third yeah. month of this. And we've mm -hmm. finally gotten a hang of it. It's quite safe to say that we have gotten the hang of this. Now, when we first started, it was quite overwhelming. Uh, I have to say this. Now, we had a plethora. We have a variety of teaching materials, tools, platforms that we had to learn within a few days and within a few uh, weeks. Yeah, The first few weeks, we had to juggle with our new rules as stay-at-home parents, like Irma, stay-at-home mm -hmm. children, like our students and lecturers. So juggling between different roles at home and trying to filter quality materials, quality tools for assessment was definitely difficult. I yeah. had a tough time. Yeah. Now, another thing that I realized is that 
online teaching may cater mainly to our visual students, our auditory learners, our visual learners, but our kinesthetic learners are def definitely losing out on the fun they get doing hands-on tasks and moving around in class. So it limits social interaction. And I do not know if you can agree with me, but my students have been hesitant to ask questions or to engage in conversations. Now, we often have a tough, tough time with class management. Yeah? When we walk into class, our classes are either too active or too noisy. We have a tough time with class management, but uh, I do not know if you can attest to this. I am having a tough time to getting my students to actually talk in my online classes. So yeah, I have to yeah. ask. I have to ask them again and again if they have anything to say, if they understand, and it's very, very difficult to get them to interact. It's very difficult to spark social interaction. Now, yeah. my yeah. my biggest fear is, however, when we first transition, many of us because we are overwhelmed, even students are overwhelmed. We may it may amplify the fear of being alone. It may amplify the fear of missing. Uh, missing out. So FOBA and FOMO, these are urban dictionary terms that our millennials are definitely very familiar. Now, this forced adoption of technology delivered instruction has been a challenging phase for all of us in HMC, I'm sure. But we are now third month now, and I'm very, very glad that we have a great support system in our faculty. Yeah. Yeah. That has been a great help, and we have a good management that has offered a lot of upskilling programs, free Coursera courses that helped us in coping with this transition. I definitely have to agree with it. And I I just realized that there's a term for what we've been doing, ERT, emergency response teaching. So thanks for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Darwin, I'm also glad that you brought up the point on how some of us are, are forced to juggle many roles. I can certainly attest to that. It's been rather challenging for me trying to teach online and have a 10 year old milling around, uh, asking me to help her set up her Zoom classes so she can have her classes. But uh, having said all that, like you, I am also grateful for the support that the department has given us. Though it's been challenging, but it has been manageable. And if I dare say so, kind of fun. It's uh, something new for me, and I'm always excited to try something new. Right, uh, like many of my fellow lecturers, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Darwin, who have been teaching online since the start of MCO, I am trying to get the hang of it. I I'm getting the hang of it, I guess. Of course, there's been some challenges, but then again, what is life without challenges, right? Now, when Sam and Raj were with us, it was face-to-face -face teaching all the way. So Sam, I'm interested to know if you think conventional teaching is still relevant in today's day and age, or is online teaching the way to go, Sam? What do you think? Um, I, I think I think there are two questions to hear. Uh, number one, I also would like to illustrate how difficult it is for during this time for any educators. So even in my company that conducts uh, e-commerce training, I have to say that it is a very steep learning curve. So I understand mm -hmm. what exactly you know uh, Dr. Ma and, and Darwinda is going through as well. Um, say for example, uh, my offline trainings could go like maybe eight hours per day. No one in any logical sense, can stay online for eight hours and absorbing all those information. It's impossible, right? <laughs> Your head's going to yeah. explode, right? Mm -hmm. So what I had to do is I had to split them into like one hour and one and a half hours just to make sure that the interaction is there, the engagement is still existing. Right. And many say that, you know, um, the convenience of learning online I think this is more applicable for the students now. Lah, huh? So when they, when, they, when they tune in online, they can tune in at their own time, they can adjust at their own comfort in their bedroom. They can even wear pajamas. Okay, well, I think <laughs> because, true. right, the top is all, you know, looking good. The bottom yes. is probably pajamas, <laughs> right? needs to know, that's right. Yeah, it's the new fashion sense of MCO, okay? Um, yeah. But trust me, for any educators and trainers, the effort for delivering the learning through online requires not double not even triple, but even more, especially with a crowd that you have no previous interaction. So for lecturers like you all, you all may have interacted with your students before. So there's that sense of familiarity. For trainers like us, we are being engaged by multinational companies and those are just the first day we are seeing them and we have to engage them. So those are the challenges that we have to face. But the good news is it gets even better because we've practiced, you know, mix perfect. So Definitely. if coming back to this relevant question is that is teaching still relevant, um, online teaching still relevant, 
or traditional conventional teaching is still relevant. Um, I think I can sum it up in this. From a business point of view, uh, it is definitely a challenge to balance between, um, is it a sustainable venture for education? Uh, balancing between finance and profit. But at the other hand, uh, you also have to balance whether people can really learn and also um, can they really be engaged. So that's a genuine concern, something to find a balance. So how right. to strike that balance? The foremost is to recognize that in the education industry, it's very important that someone learns. So there's also a reputation to take care of. So if the core business, just like help, and also my business is into, you know, within the education, then I guess the way forward is to keep to our core values, which is to help an individual to grow. We are educators first, regardless whether is it conventional teaching when RMCO is lifted and is available, or either even online teaching as a blended learning together with conventional, our goal must always be keeping the learner in mind that they can get the content across and they can be educated. So I think that's my answer for this one. Yeah, thank you so much for that insight, Sam. Um, what do you think, Raj? Is conventional teaching still relevant or is online teaching the way to go? Um, it's a it's a challenging question to answer. It's very tricky. There are a lot of factors to take into account, but this is what I think about it. So like Dr. Dalvinder mentioned, students, when they learn, we have different ways of learning, whether we are more auditory or we learn by being practical or we are more of a reader, right? Um, my personal preference, and I know a lot of my peers feel the same way, is that we prefer a blended learning approach where mm. there is still the human element. And trust me, when it comes to education and learning, the human element is so, so, so important. Not everything in the world you can learn from a computer screen, right? You can learn how to make a fire, but unless you go out and make a fire, you're not going to learn how to make a fire, right? Uh, but right. That, that same concept can be applied to everything. Um, so the human element is something which I feel should never be disregarded or removed in the process of gaining knowledge and becoming a better individual, becoming a, a smarter person, a wiser person. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, with the technology and the tools that we have, there is a lot of room for greater access to knowledge, greater convenience and greater flexibility. So I'll share with you, like being in the digital marketing industry, it is a very, very fast evolving industry. What you know this week is not going to be the, the ideas and the knowledge that is going to help you next week. So we have to be constantly learning. And I guess once you enter into the, the working world or being in this industry specifically, the fastest way for you to get information is through online. So there mm -hmm. are a lot of platforms, a lot of courses available online where you can literally learn a new skill, a new technical ability in a very structured manner. The whole course is available entirely online. So there is this other option as well. Of course, the practical part of it, you do not have a, you do not have a teacher or a guide to tell you, okay, now you've learned all this theoretical knowledge. This is how you apply it to a specific campaign. You don't get that. So right. if you put these two things together, for example, if I just have to paint a very rough picture of it, right? If I joined the foundation in arts course, maybe let's say five years down the road, and if I wanted to learn digital marketing as a skill, it could be Monday to Wednesday, I'm learning online. There's a very structured course. I see for the next 12 weeks what I'm going to be learning, what the assessments are, which is relatively similar to what you guys are doing now, right? And then on mm -hmm. Thursday and Friday, I meet my lecturer, I meet my instructor live in university, and then we go through a case study or a campaign. And then this instructor says, okay, this lecture says, you have learned all this from Monday to Wednesday. Now let's put it into a real life scenario, into a real life application. So this kind of blended learning, not only is it engaging for everyone because you're sort of accommodating to all different learning styles, but it also gives you a real life uh, simulation or a real life practice of how things really happen in work where you need to be a self learner, but at the end of the day, you're working with a team to solve a problem. So I think a blended learning right. approach is really like a, a very promising direction to look at right yeah thank you Raj so from what I can gather from both Sam and Raj you both agree that uh, not a hundred percent online a blended one would be better now let's hear it from an academic point of view Dr. Dalwin what do you think conventional teaching or online teaching this is an interesting question, Irma, but I definitely have to agree with what Sam and Rajas mentioned. Even from an academic point of view, I would say 
There are definitely many indicators that this crisis is going to transform the, uh, the, the education aspect here. Yeah? Basically, one thing that people may consider, one thing institutions may consider is to actually move to online teaching. But I believe, I don't think moving to fully online teaching at this time would be a good idea. Now, there is a lot of stigma stigma that is involved in online teaching. So it will take some time to break the stigma of online education in Malaysia. And I would definitely, however, applaud the move to blend learning. You can either blend learning, you can flip learning, and you can even use hybrid learning approaches. Now, when you blend learning, there's more of the face-to-face -face component involved. When you flip learning, you still have a fair share of online and face-to-face, -face, but in hybrid learning, you have 50 online and 50 face-to-face. -face. So I think the human touch is definitely essential and we still need that to foster many interpersonal skills such as empathy, cooperation, leadership skills, communication, which is That's best done right. collaboration. I believe it's best done in a face-to-face -face setting. So we have to remember that technology is a tool but not a goal. So in addition to the hard skills such as technology, to, uh, in addition to data analytics, which are definitely crucial in our ever-changing educational landscape, we also have to remember that the social and emotional aspects of an individual is best uh, fostered, best, uh, best helped, uh, best developed via face-to-face -face interaction. Right, so we, we can all agree that uh, whether, you know, even if we do proceed with online learning, it has to have some sort of human human touch to it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whether face-to-face -face or online, the teaching still goes on. We at HMC still put in 110% in our teaching. Yes, it has been different. Yes, it has been challenging on some days that you cannot believe, but we take it in our stride and give it our best. Um, Thank you, panelists, for your thoughts and insights. We will now go ahead and take some time for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, should you have any questions, please go ahead and type it in the chat box. It seems like we have one question here. Uh, it says here, do you think curriculum should include equal emphasis on social and emotional development? Do you think curriculum should include equal emphasis on social and emotional development? Perhaps I can get uh, maybe Sam to tackle this first. Um, I think right now, today's education is not just focusing on just the subject itself, but the nature of the subject and what you want to bring up. So in terms of social and emotional, uh, I think it's very important that when a subject has been taught or either a case study mm. has been shared, it could be able to touch people's lives and impact them personally, which is why the human factor is so important, which is why mm. the experience of a lecturer is so important to bring out and draw out that sort of experiences to the learners themselves and they go through it. And obviously in some of the subjects where you can further emphasize, so I, I would think like um, subjects like psychology, right? Where they can, mm. we can bring in a little bit more in terms of the social impact of what you study towards next time in what you're working. So they can relate. And I think other subjects whereby the lecturers can also relate. After you have studied this, you have gone through this, you know, experience the learning outcome. In the next time, this is how you can actually impact the social. Um, I, I think there won't be any sort of like a 50-50. There's no hybrid in this. Uh, but I believe that having some form of social or emotional within that module is very important for a learner to absorb. Right. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, we have another question here from uh, Mr. Iskanda. Mr. Iskanda is asking, as Malaysia is moving towards IR 4.0, what do you think should the what do you think the government should provide in making sure no one is left behind when and if Malaysia is ready for full online classes? So once more, as Malaysia is moving towards IR 4.0, what do you think the government should provide in making sure that no one is left behind, as well as when and if Malaysia is ready for full online classes? Perhaps Dr. Dalwinder can, can tackle this question. Thank you, Iskandar, for the question. Now, yeah, we are moving to the fourth uh, educational revolution, and no doubt it's very important that uh, the children should get equal access. Now, if you are going to move to online education, we must make sure that no one is left behind and all children should be getting equal access to technology and the online tools. 
But it's quite unfortunate that in Malaysia, there are still many schools, there are still many children who do not have access, uh, who do not have the facilities to actually use online, uh, online tools and online platforms. Now, I'm sure the recent MCO, we, we were quite aware how many children, even university students, were not able to access online education. Now, things that the government should do or uh, efforts that government should make to tackle this is, of course, to make sure to leverage the online tools, to make sure all schools get equal access to technology, all schools get equal uh, access to internet, especially. Now, there are many schools in rural as areas, especially in Sabah, Sarawak, where students do not have uh, internet access. So if, we, if we, have, we can make sure that all school children have internet access, then we will, we will be able to break the online education stigma in Malaysia, and we will slowly be ready to move to a fully online education. Mm, thank you so much, Dr. Darwin. So I hope uh, Dr. Darwin has... Uh,